uh, get going. Uh, I want to welcome everybody on behalf of Specialty Care uh, to our 15th uh, ongoing webinar series. Tonight we have a wonderful uh, presenter with an excellent topic. I think it's going to be very uh, stimulating and, and definitely generate a lot of discussion following uh, his presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, our co-moderator tonight is Bridget Fomby, who's the uh, chief perfusionist uh, and works out of Baptist Health in Paducah in specialty care, and, uh, and myself, uh, Al Stammers. Before I introduce Dr. Manning, just a couple of uh, housekeeping details. Uh, remember, uh, in order to receive the 1.2 CEUs Category 1, uh, please log in and stay logged in. I, I don't think I have to tell you this. I, you know, it's going to be a wonderful presentation, but for a minimum of 45 minutes, and then uh, complete that very short uh, post-presentation uh, survey and submit it. I think it's just a question or two. Uh, the CE certificates will be emailed. They're usually sent out within a week's time period. Um, and if you don't uh, receive them by then, please reach out. Uh, my email will be at the end as well as Bridget's. Uh, reach out to either of us and we'll make sure that you do receive it. Uh, the recorded presentation will be posted on YouTube and it usually takes a few days for that to come up as, as well. So um, from a discussion perspective, we uh, this is a normal Zoom call, a Zoom call so please use the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and uh, write in any type of questions that you have. Remember, these are rated. If you have a similar question to one that's already been asked, you can just like that one and that'll pop it up to the top of the queue. Uh, Bridget and I will watch that and, um, and then we'll, we'll usually start at the top of the list and work our way through the, uh, the questions and answers. Um, and if it's okay with you, if you put your name in there, we will we'll announce who your name is as we uh, read the question. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our, our keynote speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Mike Manning. Uh, Dr. Manning is an associate professor at the department or in the Department of Anesthesiology at Duke University Medical Center. Um, well educated at uh, one uh, phenomenal uh, center at the University of Kentucky Lexington, where he received both his uh, undergraduate degree and both his PhD and MD degrees. He uh, completed a residency in anesthesiology, both at the University of Kentucky, then a fellowship at cardiothoracic anesthesia um, at Duke University, and also completed his postdoctoral research fellowship there as well. Uh, presently, he's a director of research. He serves on multiple committees at Duke and throughout uh, various professional societies. Um, his uh, in vitro research and is translational in general. Uh, some of the topic areas and what his PhD thesis was on was the angiotensin, angiotensin system regulation during cardiac surgery, as well as the inflammatory response that's initiated with cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac surgery. Clinically, um, he's researched uh, cardiorenal renal protection during cardiac surgery, as well as looking at a number of uh, novel risk factors associated with perioperative organ dysfunction. He's also doing a lung transplant tonight, so um, uh, he graciously is going to be with us uh, for the hour and perhaps a little longer if the uh, question and answers uh, are, are continuing. He has numerous teaching and research awards. He's well published. A lot of his recent publications or, um, in the last year or two have been on ECMO. Uh, both in Vino Venus and, uh, and VA ECMO, as well as uh, being actively involved in the enhanced recovery after cardiac surgery element, the EROS element. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, he's uh, just published a paper which he's going to discuss aspects on uh, this evening on continuous ultrafiltration, ultrafiltration during cardiopulmonary bypass and some of its effects on uh, AKI and uh, morbidity and mortality. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Manning to take control of the screen and um, proceed with his slide deck. I have to say thank you so much for that introduction. That was absolutely fantastic. I didn't know I was that good. I have to tell my wife that. Let's see here. Can you guys see that okay? All right, good. All right, so uh, disclosures and disclaimers first. So I do serve on the advisory board for Edwards Life Sciences and I write educational content for uh, Retia Medical and also for Up To Date. And the disclaimers, <clears throat> I am not a perfusionist. Uh, I am a physiologist, but not a perfusionist. So 
what I wanted to do today, tonight, <clears throat> and kind of recover or uh, cover this uh, based on some of the things that uh, Al wanted me to review. So we're going to look at the uh, data and the outcomes from our experience, and kind of take a little bit of time to reflect on some possible mechanisms and the drivers of AKI in the context that we're going to present and then discuss some rational approaches to the next step to try to begin to address some of the mechanisms and possible interventions uh, to prevent AKI. So for the sake of this talk, there are, I know, different flavors of ultrafiltration, but we're gonna focus on continuous ultrafiltration as it's currently being used for hemoconcentration and increasing hematocrit on bypass. So, the story starts for us as uh, a perfusionist, an intensivist, and a cardiac anesthesiologist walk into a bar. Um, and so my co-authors, uh, Dean Linder is a perfusionist down at Oshner now. Um, he was here at Duke, and Camarus Gadimi is a cardiac intensivist and cardiac anesthesiologist with me. And one evening we went out together after a particularly long and grueling day in the OR, and we were discussing a case that we had all shared uh, Dean and I were in the OR, and we had dropped this patient off to, to Dr. Gadimi. And what we noticed about the patient was that it seemed like I could never, uh, once we came off bypass, I was struggling. I could not keep the pressures up. Um, the heart function looked great, but the patient persisted to be acidotic. Urine output had fallen off to almost nothing. And it looked like the patient was just really fluid, uh, fluid down. Um, and it, it, it was really odd because the hematocrit looked good, everything else looked fine, and the pressure requirements were going up and up and up. And uh, Cam was in the ICU and he said, you know, the, this patient was severely acidotic when he got him and required ongoing resuscitation. And we didn't really understand kind of what had happened during the case. And Dean piped up and said, well, I tanked him up for you guys. He should, you know, he should have been fine. And we're like, well, what do you mean you tanked him up? And he said, well, I got him pristine. You know, I, I ultrafiltrated him up to a hemoglobin of 10. And we're like, wait a minute. What do you mean you ultrafiltrated him up to a hemoglobin of 10? And that started the discussion. And so, Heretofore, I think cardiac anesthesiologists and perfusionists were operating kind of in our own silos. We kind of knew what each other was doing, but we really didn't appreciate more the nuanced practice. And so Dean gave us a couple of papers, and I'm sure your audience is very familiar with this one, um, as background and looking at the, how ultrafiltration was being used to manage blood transfusion during cardiac surgery. And this was a wonderful meta-analysis. And it was well done. It had uh, over a thousand patients in it, different studies um, from 1986 through uh, early 2000. And this was a kind of a combination of patients that got ultrafiltration or MUF or combination of the two. And what they noticed is that far as outcome was that by ultrafiltrating in all these studies, it seemed to favor that it reduced blood product use by, I mean, by driving the hemoglobin up. And interesting in this paper, they also said that it seemed to decrease postoperative bleeding. And Dean reviewed this with us. And about that same time, the Michigan paper came out, another very nice study. Uh, this was uh, about 6,000 patients over 21 centers uh, throughout Michigan. And what was interesting is that they had outcome data attached to this. Um, and they looked at acute kidney injury in those patients that did not get ultrafiltrated versus those that did. And they found unadjusted p-values uh, of significance with AKI, um, prolonged ventilation, low cardiac output, red blood cell transfusion was a little higher. But when they did their statistical analysis and made their adjustments, a lot of this fell out. And so we kind of wondered, you know, what was their 
what was their findings? So they, they very nicely pointed out that their findings suggested that ultrafiltration was associated with higher adjusted odds of AKI, lower cardiac output, and fewer red cell transfusions, despite just slightly higher first somatocrits in the intensive care. Um, but what was interesting was that they said when they modeled the ultrafiltration volumes as a continuous variable, they found no harm associated with increased volume removed when they indexed it to a patient's weight, exclusive of higher AKI rates. So they said that there's really not a relationship. Now, being the physiologists that we are, we stopped and it's like, wait a minute, let's wrap our head around this. So when you take a blood sample and you spin it down, you, you get fractions, right? You get plasma-free water and you get your red blood cells at the bottom. And that's what you measure hematocrit of, it's a ratio. And so when Dean was telling us that he pulls plasma-free water off, in essence, what he was doing was he said, right, he's increasing the hemoglobin and he's in increasing the hematocrit. But the hemoglobin increases after ultrafiltration, uh, ultra but the hemoglobin mass does not. What you're only doing is you're changing the ratio. And this is important. The overall volume in the patient decreases, but the ratio is very different. And so that's where it led to the to the start of our work and try to wrap our heads around this. So we started off and tried to be as very clean with this as we could because we were gonna pull only our own center's data. We weren't gonna pull data from other hospitals. We knew how we practiced and we could keep our, we felt we could keep our analysis as clean and pristine as we possibly could. So our starting hypothesis was, was that AKI is defined by the KDIGO classification, which we felt to be a lot more sensitive to early uh, kidney injury was associated with increased ultrafiltration volume removed. And so we did a three-year retrospective study of all adults undergoing elective non-emergent cardiac surgery using cardiopulmonary bypass. And we were very, very careful to define our patient population to start with. So we excluded anybody with heart uh, ejection fractions less than 40% because the relationship between the cardiorenal syndromes, we uh, wanted to have good functioning hearts at baseline. Any patient with a history of renal disease or previous injury, transplants, end-stage renal disease um, were excluded. We excluded anybody getting devices, anybody getting reoperations within 72 hours to the index surgery or transplants. And so that ended up with a study population of 1,676. And you can see the distribution here. It was 695 patients underwent cabbage, 697 for valve surgery, and 284 for combined cabbage valve. And so we wanted to be very, very crystal clear when we started. And so we were evaluating the um, CUF volume as an independent factor in the development of AKI. And we began with clear a priori definitions. And so rather than treating CUF as a continuous variable, we wanted to use weight indexed CUF volumes, but we broke it into quartiles. And we used the CUF UDIN to optimize the weight-based index CUF volume for cutoff as it predicted AKI. And we used the ROC and the UDIN index J statistic to set that limit. And then using kind of classic statistical methods we went through to evaluate the differences between the groups and to identify those things that are classic, classically associated with uh, known AKI, such as diabetes. And those variables that we found to be statistically significant at uh, less than 0.15 were considered as candidate covariates to construct our final multivariate regression model. And when we did that, we, here we show those patients that did not develop any AKI is defined by KDIGO class zero, and those that did by class one, two, and three. And you can see that the, the, there's a little bit of an age effect in those patients that got uh, some AKI. BMI was slightly higher. Type two diabetes was a little bit higher in those that got AKI. Uh, essential hypertension just made the cutoff as well as pulmonary hypertension. Um, 
and uh, pre-existing or history of coronary artery disease uh, was, was uh, what we took as a predictor. And then we were very careful to look at practice parameters between the two. And you can see that um, the ultrafiltration volumes between those that developed AKI and those that did not uh, was slightly higher. Um, the last hematocrit prior to surgery was 39 versus 38. Statistically significant, but we don't feel that this is actually clinically relevant. Aortic cross clamp times were slightly different. Cardiopulmonary bypass times were slightly different. We'll get into that in a little bit. The TM, the time uh, index of 50, is the time that the patient spent during the bypass run with a pressure less than 50. And so we took that as a way to um, calibrate when the surgeons say, oh, down on flow or up on flow or um, alternating flow at the pump where we thought pressure might be an issue. And then the lowest intraoperative hematic crit as it was reported, lowest hemoglobin on bypass uh, and the rest you can see. And so what we found when we compared those patients that got AKI versus those that didn't, when you broke into quartiles, the, the more volume you took off, the higher your post-operative creatinine levels went. And they, they go up on the evening of surgery, they max out on post-op day one, and they continue to rise and stay elevated. We tracked it out through 10 days. Kedigo's classes through seven days. Uh, but we wanted to see if there was some resolution and there wasn't in our time window. And when you looked at the, um, the quartiles and you looked at how much volume you're taking off, what we noticed when we broke it into the classes here, class one, class two, class three, you could see that with the more volume you took off, the severity of the AKI increased. So you had more patients with class one, class two, and class three going up. So not only did AKI rates go up with more volume, but the severity of the injury went up as well. When we looked at blood transfusions, again, our blood transfusions mirrored the volume. So as patients had more volume taken off, uh, this is 32.6 mils per kilo was the, the highest quartile. Um, our transfusion rates went up. And we calculated a vasoactive infusion score. And so this is a specific score that looks at the use of vasopressors and ionotropes. So we expected to see that uh, as more volume came off and transfusions went up, there would be a need for increasing our ionotrope use and our vasopressor use. And you can see that there's a kind of a lot of variability. So we think that this probably isn't the cleanest way to look at that. We had thought by using this uh, vasoactive um, ionotropic infusion score, we would be able to, to get a little bit more granular data, but I think that's probably not uh, as clean as we thought it was. And so what we concluded from that was is that increasing amounts of ultrafiltration is associated with AKI and renal injury at our institution in our hands as we had performed the study. And we didn't find that CUF is effective at removing extracellular or interstitial fluid in these patients as we, I think, hoped that it would. And CUF really didn't have any effect in our hands on reducing transfusions. In fact, the amount of blood transfused in these patients increased. Um, and so, I think that moving forward, we certainly need to develop more rational approaches to fluid management. So as we finish that up, we started to look at and think about uh, possible mechanisms. And we're all familiar with the determinants of oxygen delivery, where you have cardiac output uh, and hemoglobin playing a role, as well as your partial pressures of oxygen that you're delivering. But going back to this, this concept that if we pull fluid off, we're increasing the hemoglobin or we're increasing the hematocrit. Um, again, we, when you look at it and you think about what you're doing, you know, you're pulling blood and putting it in a test tube and you're thinking that that's reflective of what's going on in the patient. And I think it's an artificial 
and very much a contrived number. And so we tried to model this for ourselves, and this is probably an oversimplification considering the audience I'm talking to, but bear with me, I'm just an anesthesiologist. So when you hook a patient up and you have a venous return into a reservoir through the pump oxygenator, you start pulling off CUF, right? And you're pulling off plasma water. I think we forget that we're also losing volume and hematocrit and hemoglobin to wall suction that's not recovered, to sponges and the drapes. And so if we look at it in a slightly different way and we think of the body as more of a tank with a total blood volume of five liters, your reservoir and your lines are about one and a half liters. Um, and during the cases, there are studies that have published that uh, blood loss to sponges, drapes, and wall suction can amount to about a liter of volume. As you go on pump, we exsanguinate the body. And so we're concerned that that level of exsanguination rapidly triggers neuroendocrine um, factors such as activating the renin angiotensin system. And this is one of the things that I'm particularly interested in. Um, stretch receptors in the right atrial appendage appear to become active and secrete tissue angiotensin too. And I know that there are uh, suggestions uh, dating back into the late 70s, early 80s that when cardiopulmonary bypass became non-pulsatile, um, I believe it was uh, Kenneth Taylor out of the UK looked uh, at that effect on the renin and angiotensin system and found that circulating levels of angiotensin II go up. So that may come to play. Uh, we'll discuss that here in a little bit. But as we drop the volume in the patient, these neurohumoral effects are active. And I think the other issue is where do you measure flow? So we found out that at our institution, the flow monitor that our perfusionists were looking at to measure flow to the patient. So when we we're requesting an index flow of 2.6 liters, that was actually coming off the oxygenator before the shunt over to the hemofilter. And so if you're running the shunt line off your main line that goes to the patient, your, your index flow here coming out of the oxygenator may be 2.6, but what actually goes to the patient is not 2.6. It's 2.6 minus whatever the flow through the shunt line is. And so we now have moved this to be right on the arterial line going directly into the patient, way downstream of any shunt or uh, anything that's coming off. So flow is now corrected for us to be exactly what goes into the arterial circuit. So the other issue is if you wrap a patient at the beginning of the case, that can be anywhere from a half liter to seven or, a, you know, up to a liter, but usually it's about 750 mils. So that takes your total blood volume in the patients down further. Um, and then you couple that with where you're measuring flow um, along with ongoing or intermittent hematocrit blood loss. So if you're taking off more ultrafiltration fluid to keep that hemoglobin levels up, I think all we're doing is generating an artificial number and that's not reflective of total body hemoglobin. We don't have a great way to measure that yet. Um, I know there are people working on it, we're working on it, but we're missing out on, I think, an underlying physiologic principle that we're not delivering the oxygen to the kidneys that we think we are. Um, and again, a lot of this is uh, directed by flow. I know as the hemoglobin goes down, you can correct your oxygen delivery by increasing your pump flows. But again, going back to where you measure that, uh, I think that's critical. So I think for, for us, Mechanistically, I think there's several things that are coming into play. Um, and I think there's so much more research that needs to be done in this area. And I think there needs to be good, dedicated, prospective trials moving forward. Um, I also think there needs to be a lot more communication uh, between the anesthesiologists and the perfusionists, um, being a lot more thoughtful and an individualized approach to the patients that are in front of us. Uh, patients with um, mitral regurgitation coming from mitral repair, 
tend to be a little bit more volume overloaded. Um, but as a perfusionist in the room, you may not be aware as much as the surgeon may or the anesthesiologist that the patients have been kind of tuned up to the best that they can be uh, before they come in. And so their volume status starting off may be a little bit below uh, what's appreciated. A lot, of, a lot of times there's just not a great fluid monitor uh, for those kinds of assessments. So understanding the patient in front of us is I think very important. And I think moving forward, you know, planning, uh, planning a care plan outside of the OR um, before we come into the OR is, is important. And, and here uh, we've gotten to the motto of saying, we'll think first and we'll do later. And so we'll build into our um, initial uh, timeout scenario. As we discuss the surgical planning, we'll also discuss a fluid management plan between the surgeon, the perfusionist, and the anesthesiologist. And so I want to thank you for uh, your attention and thank you for everything. Wonderful, Mike. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And I think it's, it's a stimulating uh, topic for sure. Um, you know, we as perfusionists have uh, always um, kept ultrafiltrators near and dear and, um, and use them. You know, uh, one of the questions I'll start with um, is, uh, is the, the availability of these devices. Uh, some perfusion packs, obviously there's many, just like there are a lot of anesthesia diversity in the equipment that you use. Um, some of the perfusion packs come automatically um, outfitted with an ultrafiltrator. Uh, in place, and and I, when I used to use these packs, you you almost feel obligated. It's like, well, it's there. It's already part of the pack. We primed it. You know, you feel like you should run something uh, uh, through it. But the question I have is getting back to something you mentioned earlier with uh, retrograde autologous priming, wrap, and, and autologous prime in general. Um, you know, some individuals say, well, I I don't need to wrap because I'm going to ultrafiltrate the volume thereafter. Uh, and so, you know, they'll allow a, um, let's say, a, a lower hematocrit because they realize that they'll be able to take some volume off, you know, shortly, let's say within the first 30 minutes or 45 minutes of a pump run. What are your feelings on replacing one blood management technique uh, with RAP with the, uh, the use of an ultrafiltrator? I, I think they both have their, their deficits in... I think they're problematic in different ways. I think wrapping, you take way more volume off initially. And so I think the, the general fluid volume of a patient goes down faster. Um, I think a lot of times we'll have to augment the pressures uh, to some degree with giving boluses of phenylephrine or norepinephrine, and, and those come at a cost. That changes the microcirculation, that changes uh, tissue perfusion. Uh, I also think it activates the renin angiotensin system um, more potently, more abruptly. And I think that those levels uh, rise um, a little bit quicker. And they have those, they have those um, issues. Um, ultrafiltration, I think, is a little more gentle. You're spreading the insult over, you know, your pump run. But it, again, at the end, um, you know, if you're pulling fluid off to keep your your hematocrit and your hemoglobin above a transfusion trigger, you know, you could really make those numbers whatever that you want them to be. And I think that that's, that's the problem. You know, we're, we're not looking at total hemoglobin mass like we should. Uh, we're looking at, at a very artificial level. You know, if you had the patient circulating blood volume uh, to begin with, to back calculate that, I think then you could use your hemoglobin levels in a, a much more accurate way. But I think both of them are, are kind of flawed, but in different ways. Uh, Bridget, do you want to... Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, I was just going to attend to this next question. Um, the question is, must we use ultrafiltration when we're using gel needle or custodial cardioplegia? So, because we're using an awful, an awful lot of volume, you know, crystalloid using right. both. Right. So what's your so, suggestion? Mm -hmm. So 
we we used uh, Plegisol um, during the time that we looked. Um, so Del Nido wasn't a factor. Uh, we have since moved to Del Nido and we will keep track of the volume of Del Nido that's used. Um, if it gets to be a liter or more, then we will ultrafiltrate off what is given. Um, but if it's a liter or less, we think that the kidneys can handle that. They should be able to handle that. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Mike, there's a number of questions um, on uh, um, oxygen delivery. Obviously, uh, goal-directed perfusion, goal-directed fluid management is, is something that really has caught our attention over the last 15 years. Um, so, so one of the questions here is, uh, and you, you know, put up the, the FIC equation very well, and you talked about how important oxygen delivery is. Um, and, and the comments that are here, there are several on DO2, uh, is that it, it really needs to be optimized and that it's related to um, AKI uh, in regards to some either nadir value or you know, more recently, I think the research has looked at area under the curve, uh, both the depth and the time period that uh, DO2 levels are are reduced, and, uh, and some studies are coming out and saying that that's probably a better indicator than a, a nadir value, as, as you have pointed out several times in your presentation as far as hemoglobin. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on DO2? Uh, should, it, should it be something that we use these various blood management opportunities that we have available to us, such as ultrafiltration, RAP, and, and a myriad of others, autotransfusion? Um, to, to optimize DO2 along with increasing flow, of course, as you pointed out. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, on DO2 uh, for, for AKI specifically? So one of the things that we kind of piloted a little bit was, you know, working through the DO2 equation based on various hematocrits, assuming that we pulled off more volume and raised it a couple of points. It's really interesting how the DO2 calculations um, change with whatever hemoglobin you plug in. Um, so I would be cautious about blindly following that without understanding and having a deep appreciation of where those values that go in that equation actually come from. Um, you know, we can measure accurately a PaO2. That's not a problem. We get that on a blood gas. Um, the hemoglobin is the issue that I have a problem with. The flow, I think, if you measure it on the arterial um, limb that goes right into the aorta, I think that's the most accurate flow. Um, I don't know right now the best way to, to get at the hemoglobin level because that's really the key, right? That's the little cars that carry the oxygen to the tissues. Um, And in, in absence of some of the tissue monitors that are specific for tissue oxygenation that tend to be rather expensive and kind of cumbersome to use, um, we don't really have a great option. Let me follow that up real quickly, if you don't mind, Bridget. Bob Diger sure. out of UPMC is, um, you know, made a really good point. Uh, a couple of publications are out that looked at PO2 levels in urine um, as a, an opportunity of non-invasively um, assessing uh, how well oxygen is being delivered, at least to the you know, renal uh, structures. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, you know, with uh, maintaining uh, a higher PO2 level, uh, urinary PO2, a little easier to, I, I guess, measure non-invasively than a, you know, continuous me measurements? That's an interesting premise. There was a, a paper in anesthesiology in 2017, I think, Lana Meyer um, from Sweden, and they looked at renal blood flow and renal perfusion and oxygen delivery after bypass. They, they placed a, a pulmonary artery catheter into the, the renal vein and measured blood flow that way. And they noticed that on bypass, the oxygen extraction in the kidneys went up by almost 30%, if I remember right. And the, how did they measure it? It was 
renal oxygen delivery was optimized and they were measuring it right out of the vein. But oxygen extraction went up and it continued to stay up after the end of bypass. So it's an interesting concept to look at oxygen in the urine. I don't know in that setting mechanistically what's going on. It looks like the kidneys from that paper, that was a 18 patients prospectively collected data. And what they found was it looked like the kidneys were hypermetabolic during bypass. So blood flow was shunted away from the kidneys despite the pressure being maintained. So I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that's a byproduct byproduct of like the renin angiotensin system communicating to the kidneys and saying, okay, you need to retain salt, um, you need to retain water, and the kidneys go into this hypermetabolic hyper state to tr really try to sequester that fluid. Um, I know in your paper that just came out, it was a very nice paper, um, even Z-buff uh, seemed to decrease urine output. So something's communicating to the kidneys to become hypermetabolic and hold on to water in that setting. Um, so I don't know that renal urinary or um, yeah, renal, renal oxygen utilization and oxygen delivery, I don't, I don't know what to make of it as far as an AKI issue coming out of the urine. Does that make sense? want to um I yes yes um there is a question about the mechanism in which the creatinine is increased especially if you are measuring your flow after your shunt and you had explained that that's where we should be measuring our flow because then we're past the shunt and so we know directly what we're giving the patient so um this individual wants to know the mechanism in which AKI is being caused um, besides, I guess, your finding of an increase in creatinine post-pump. How is it being, um, mechanistically, it's, I think it's very, very complicated. I think it's neurohumoral issues. I think it's partially iatrogenic. Um, I think patients are volume depleted by ultrafiltration. I think the response to the impending hypotension that we see, practitioners will increase the um, vasopressor use. I think there's a smoldering injury already. I think the, the resuscitation is delayed to the ICU. Um, and then typically at that point, patients are transfused. So it may be that the iron burden from a transfusion on top of an initial injury that occurred in the OR with ultrafiltration and, and fluid management at that point is compounding. It may be a two hit hypothesis. They may have some initial kidney injury long before they come to the OR and then they have mm -hmm. this and that compounds it. So, you know, this is a very dirty field to kind of get into AKI with, because there's so many different things. Um, we took something that I think may be overlooked as a contributor and may have long-term ramifications in how we manage patients, right? We may be thinking we're, you know, we're doing good. Yes, we're keeping the hemoglobin up. We're not transfusing, but gosh darn it, we've created a situation now where they're hypovolemic. I'm treating it with increasing vasopressors. And then by the time I realize that it's six to eight hours later, now I'm trying to resuscitate them. Now they're oliguric. Now I'm going to start a Lasix infusion. Now we're going to, somebody's going to start dopamine. And, you know, those studies mm -hmm. have been done. That's not the way to work it. So I think it's, it's, it's very much multifactorial. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because there's really good, we've got a large number of them here. I want to thank everybody too for writing these in. I, they're, they're, they're phenomenal, but I'm going to combine two or three and I apologize. 
Um, I've got Don, Peter Mays, and uh, uh, one other that I'm going to combine. And it's with the methodology of your research, the, the paper that was published in, in the Red Journal. And, and with that, the question is your time period of 50 or below, uh, T50, I believe is TM50, I think. Uh, the TM50, right. With, with the mean arterial pressure. Um, one comment was it seemed that uh, that was higher in the, um, the AKI group than it was in the low. There, were, there was more time at a lower blood pressure. And then following up on that, um, it seemed like there uh, was um, uh, a difference in CVP. And, and I apologize, I don't have the methodology of the results in front of me. So I'm just quoting from the questions, but, but were there differences in, in both uh, the time period for lower blood pressure uh, you already mentioned about the, uh, there wasn't really a difference in the use of vasoactive substances that were administered and also uh, volumetrically in, uh, in looking at filling pressures, say when a patient left the room. Mm -hmm. um, so the TM50, I think was, it, it wasn't significant. There was a, a slight difference. Um, it was like 360 and 380, I, I think. I would have to go back and look at my slides, but um, it, it wasn't statistically significant. I remember that. Uh, so pressure and hypotension was not, we felt, a cause of it. Um, filling pressures in a post-bypass patient, not all of our patients get swans. Um, so I don't know what the left heart filling pressures are. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that's going to look at CVP and say that that's a good marker of fluid volume status. You know, if you had somebody that came into the, to the OR with a, a CVP right after induction, of maybe seven, eight, nine, and then they left at 23, 24, 25. I think something else is going on there. Um, but I don't, I don't see uh, CVP as a isolated number or something to chase. I, I appreciate that if you increase afterload on the kidney, filtration is going to fall. Um, that's physiology 101. But I don't, I don't see that in this study that we did uh, a, a real contributor. I have a question here. It says, do you think that AKI is an acute hypovolemia problem caused by aggressive CUF? What do you consider aggressive? Um, when a perfusionist tells me I've taken off three, four, seven liters. Um, right now we try to keep our ultrafiltration less uh, for an indexed weight indexed uh, to be less than 20 mils per kilo because in, in what we found and we presented to our cardiac surgeons and in our group um, anything above that is we feel injury producing or has the potential to induce injury so we we actually try to target around 10 to 15 and so we'll accept like we were talking a little bit earlier, I think one of you asked me about the Del Nido. Um, Bridget, you had asked that. So yes. we will we will accept some, you know, extra volume um, from the Del Nido. Thank you. Yeah, following up with that, that's a really good point, Mike, and I'm glad you come you came out with a value. You know, obviously, um, needs to be proven through good prospective research, as you've also stated, but it's nice to have a target to shoot for. And really what you're doing, what you're describing, it's a question uh, and a comment to what you just said was, you know, what do you do with irrigation fluid? Uh, but with Del Nido, you know, for example, for a liter, you, if it's a standard Del Nido, you're gonna have 800 cc's of extra crystalloid. So really what you're saying is Z-buff. You know, if you say, okay, well, it's 20 cc's is your target threshold that you don't wanna go above, but, you know, let's not take into consideration, you know, either the, the Del Nido custodial or in this question that's, uh, that came out, I think from Leon. Yeah, it was Leon who asked it. Um, if you've got irrigation volume, uh, that really is a form of Z-buff, right? Let's say you, you're doing a mitral valve and you're doing, you know, testing the valve quite frequently. It's easy to give five, 600 cc's. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you just consider that not in the equation of the 20 then? 
So we, we've gotten very good as cardiac anesthesiologists, and I think we always have been very, very good at our institution um, communicating with our, our perfusionists. We, we know each other very well inside and outside the OR, and so we talk a lot. So I know how much fluid I've given at the head. Um, our perfusionists know how much volume I've given up at the head of the bed. And so together we understand how much volume has been good, how much we're like, eh, we need to watch it or, you know, let's pull off 500. But we don't do it liters at a time. Uh, it's done in small measures, um, which I think is also key. Um, you know, we, we just don't hook the thing up and, and start sucking off six, seven, eight, nine liters like we used to, uh, which was just staggering how much volume you can get out of these patients. And I saw somebody uh, make a comment about uh, perfusion through the shunt. Um, these cartridges are usually run with a um, negative pressure on them. Uh, I don't know if other centers do that as well, but at Duke, um, there's a negative, a negative, um, a negative force on that. So it, it, the suction force is constant. So if you're running volume through that shunt line, through that hemofilter cartridge, how much volume you get off is almost linear to what goes through it. I mean, it would have to be mathematically. So if you're pulling off five, six, seven liters during a pump run, you know, your pump runs 250 minutes or so, that's a lot of flow through that shunt line which I think is, is something to consider. Would you recommend following up on that then? Would you recommend that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, historically we used to put those shunts through a rower pump. Um, we wouldn't let it uh, uh, be part of the, or, or we knew exactly what was going through. If you set your flow mm -hmm. through your hemoconstrate at 500 cc's, you, you know to increase your, and your proximal to your flow meter, you need to increase your, your flow by that amount uh, so you know what's coming out. Do you, what are your thoughts on, on running it through a, uh, you know, kind of like a CRRT device? Um, maybe, uh, I'll leave that to your wheelhouse. That's that's the expertise of, a, <laughs> I think, of perfusionists. Um, what I would just be concerned at as a, as a, you know, anesthesiologist is keeping track of volume is that it's not hooked up to suction and run indiscriminately, you know, I get busy at the head of the bed. I'm sure you get busy, you know, behind the console. And if you open it up, you know, maybe it's a hectic part of the case where we're really struggling with some other issues and we get distracted. It's now run for an hour. How much volume have we inadvertently pulled off? So um, not to add more to, to people's plates, but, um, you know, thinking about it, being conscientious when we use it, um, using it with a specific goal um, that is science-based, I think is a much better way. Whether it's a, a roller pump or suction, you know, I'll leave that to the experts. And I just to follow up real quickly, Bridget, uh, Aladin Muhammad has also commented that what you just uh, said, Mike, in regards to the Del Nido, his point is, 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 is that, you know, hey, uh, I'll leave that volume in until I assess the patient, but I'm gonna watch the hemoglobin level and not take it off until it gets uh, low, which you presented in your diagrammatic form in regards to the test tube distribution of the red cell mass and, and plasma water. But I just wanted to state that, that he's confirming what, uh, what you have said. Yes. Um, Dr. Manning, what is your opinion on modified arterial filtration? Post-pump. Post-pump. Yes and putting so, our pump volume through the hemoconcentrator. For the right, and then giving it back through like a long line to the to the patient. Or we bag it and give it to anesthesia. Um, it, it's, it, I think it's good in theory. Certainly you preserve a lot of the uh, clotting factors that way. So that's a very thoughtful process to do. Um, it's almost like cell saver uh, platinum or premium, right? Because you have all the, the good coagulation in it. I, I think that blood is 
pretty acidotic when we measured it. So we may be inducing an acid load to the patient. Um, we do long line our, our cases here, um, and that's something that we do have to contend with. Um, so, you know, that may be additive. We didn't look at it because every patient gets it. Um, and we don't really track that volume specifically that's given back through the long line. Um, so that's a good point. I think that would be something that in a prospective study that would have to be addressed um, and, and handled it in a consistent manner. But I, I just worry about the, you know, the acidotic status of it. Have you ever, um, have you guys ever looked at the, the pH of it when you come off? No, I haven't. Yeah, the recent blood management guidelines uh, downclassed it uh, from a, a high level to a lower level muff um, as a blood management technique. Um, Lenny Manani has a, has a question and it's, a, it's an interesting one um, because we haven't talked about the um, iatrogenic stimulation of kidneys with the use of Lasix and other um, Bumex and other um, uh, uh, stimulating drugs that we have. What, what are your thoughts there? I mean, um, how should they be used uh, or, or is the thought process that by artificially stimulating renal um, flow with volume removal through um, urine output, that we may be doing something also as uh, that you know as, as challenging as ultrafiltration may be to uh, to uh, institute AKI? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of of giving Lasix, um, especially for an oliguric patient. The the key there is Lasix is never the, the answer. Um, they're oliguric for other reasons. Um, and, you know, with Lasix, you, you just blow out the, the, the loop of Henle and the concentrating abilities that the kidneys have. Um, you know, Lasix is a great sodium channel assassin almost. Um, and I think it also clouds the recovery. Um, so when you take a patient into the ICU and they're oliguric, the first response, oh, well, well, we need to give some Lasix. You know, the absence of urine is telling you something, not just oh, give Lasix. I think you need to think out and, and sort out what, what those issues are. And, and then I think that's part of the problem. Also, this tendency for some surgeons to um, really push dopamine and the renal dose dopamine, that still occurs. And that blows my mind. Um, that's been, you know, debunked a long time ago. Um, so I, I, I think those issues um, need to be sorted out and addressed. Um, I think the iatrogenic response that I'm talking about is um, when we don't appreciate the true volume status of the patient. Um, and I think that we start treating hypotension with the wrong thing instead of giving volume and filling the tank. Um, I think that we, we reach for vasopressors much early. Um, and there, you know, talking about volume, um, there is some old classic papers. Um, there's one in circulation research by one of the authors was Price from 1966. And they took healthy volunteers and bled them out 25% of their blood volume. And they looked at heart rate changes and blood pressure changes. And what was really interesting back then was there was no measured heart rate change. There was no measured blood pressure change. But what they found was that the splanchnic circulation took a major hit. Those studies were then replicated in the 90s by Michael Mython, who's a cardiac um, anesthesiologist and an intensivist. And now he's, he's high up in the NHS over uh, back in the UK. And they put large, um, large bore IVs in each other and uh, radio A lines. So they had very, very specific, very, very nuanced measurements of how much blood they took off of each other, uh, the arterial waveform, all of that. None of that changed, uh, but they were using gastric tenimetry and they found that the gastric pH went through the roof. So there's data there that shows that hypovolemia 
is masked well in the body, I think, through the stressed and unstressed volumes of the splanchnic circulation of which the kidneys are attached. So if the body is, uh, like in that Landenmeyer paper from 2017, if the body is shuttling blood flow away from the kidneys, it's probably moving out of the splanchnic circulation into the central circulation. And so, you know, why would you, why would you mask that with, um, with Lasix or, um, I, I just don't see that as a, that's a long winded answer to your question. I'm sorry. I love physiology. I go off on tangents. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> Um, well, there's another question here. Um, do you set a post CBB fluid balance goal at your institution? And what would you like to achieve? Or does the fluid balance goal change depending on the disease or the procedure? Uh, we try to make it very specific to the patient in front of us, how they were managed coming into the OR and the course during the OR. So if a patient is coming in off the street um, they, you know, presenting for outpatient cardiac surgery, they, they've are usually stopped eating and drinking right at midnight. Um, so they're not, interestingly enough, they're not as hypovolemic at baseline than the patients who have been in the hospital being quote unquote medically managed. Mm -hmm. Um, so those patients that come in the hospital the night before and get, you know, we have a surgeon who used to give IV fluids and Lasix the night before. Why not just let them drink and eat and pee on their own? But that's how it was managed. And so those patients in particular were, you know, they came to the OR like a raisin. So they need to be managed a little bit more. So our, our fluid therapy is gentle resuscitation after induction before bypass. Um, and then we'll go from there then we'll communicate with perfusion and, and back and forth and, and see how things go. Um, we won't trouble the surgeon too much. Um, they've got their head in the chest. They need to focus on what they're doing. We'll let them know if we're giving a lot of, you know, if suddenly we're needing to transfuse two units of red cells or, or whatnot. But generally that would be a conversation you and I would have along the way. I think the, the ideal would be is, and I, I see us as a field moving towards this, um, getting cardiac surgery patients um, optimized before they ever come to the OR. I think we're, we're moving in a direction where, at least for elective patients, we can optimize the hemoglobin levels and get them up to a point where if there is hemodilution on bypass, it's not from a starting hemoglobin of 11 to 7 or lower but it's more they're coming to the OR with a hemoglobin concentration of 15 and they might dip to 11 on bypass. That would be the ideal. That's, that's the, you know, the holy grail, I think, of, of, of management and teeing them up. But you know, getting back, it needs to be a specific conversation about where you're starting and where you think you're going, right? Yes, communication is key. Yep. You, in we teach our cardiac anesthesia fellows, you know, you, you don't show up, you first, first of all, you know, you don't pack a bag with clothes and then you don't go to the airport with those clothes and you don't just pick the first flight and hope that you get to where you wanted to go, right? If you want to go to Cancun, you pick your destination first, right? So with the patient in front of us, we pick our outcome goals, right? This patient has already got risk factors for AKI. Um, we want them to have no AKI at the end. So these are the things that we need to do. Um, and so by clearly defining our outcome goals with the patient in front of us, how we get there, how we drive forward, you know, becomes almost self-evident. It may be that, you know, maybe for this particular patient, we have to prime the pump with a unit of red cells. Okay. I think the data is going to come out that the timing of transfusions is key. I think later is bad, but I think that data is more, um, more clouded by the injuries already occurred in the OR. And so the, the injury of transfusion is being tagged on that, you know, those transfusions that are given in the, in the ICU. I think newer data that's gonna come out 
is looking at the timing of transfusions, I think you're going to see that those transfusions that were done earlier in the OR um, before the injury occurred, so either priming with blood in the bypass or shortly after, as soon as you recognize it, giving it early, I think you're going to see that those are protective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Manning, one of the uh, questions that it come up, and I know I apologize, everybody. I know we're we're over time, but uh, Dr. Manning has said he he has a few more minutes to stay around. So there's quite a few more questions. Let's try to get through maybe two or three more, um, if that's okay with everybody. And I apologize. I know we normally end exactly at the hour, but this is very stimulating. Uh, here's a question, and and Mike, you may know this, but we often, if we get hyperkalemia, or if we get um, you know perhaps even uh, hyperglycemic. Um, individuals will start using the ultrafiltrator more uh, to, uh, to knock down potassium levels, maybe give some bicarb. Um, you know, what are your thoughts there where we're using uh, this device to go ahead and, um, and, and manipulate uh, ionically uh, some of these ions? You already said uh, about a, a sodium trap, um, but, uh, but you know, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts there? Because this is something that, that we do pretty routinely on bypass. I think that's fine. I mean, if, if the potassium is dangerously high, you've got to treat it. So if you want to use the ultrafiltration cartridge for that, that's fine. Um, as long as it's not, that's the therapy that you're doing when you should be changing the, the sweep or delivering a little more oxygenation, or you've allowed the CO2 to rise higher than what you normally would. If everything else that contributes to hyperkalemia has been addressed and you want to ultrafiltration, have at it. Um, you know, that's a specific outcome you're using it for. It's a specific tool for that. Um, I think that's fine. Um, certainly hyperglycemic patients, the brittle diabetics, they're up, down, they have a lot of potassium swings associated with the glucose movement. You know, that's fine. Um, it's just, you know, don't pull off seven liters while you're doing it. Um, the next question is, can we help AKI by sequestering blood prior to going on bypass? If by sequestering blood before going on bypass means collecting it in patients, like autologous donation before they Correct. ever come to the OR? Yes, you know, within the yeah. OR, you can do right. a pre, yes, pre-pump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that's a possibility. Um, if you look at the data from Jehovah's Witnesses where they get optimized before they come to the OR and there's, uh, you know, even in the OR, the morning of surgery, you're uh, removing two units of red cells um, that is in accordance with the belief of the Jehovah's Witnesses to transfuse back at the end of the case. They do very well. Um, their AKI rates are very low. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think that's a great illustration of um, here you have a unique patient, you have an outcome that you want to drive towards, right? So this is a patient that has certain unique restrictions and requirements. We want to get them through on the backside as healthy as we possibly can. So we're going to start by optimizing them we're going to remove blood. We're going to transfuse that back to them at the right time. And they do very well. So that's something, that level of thinking and planning, we don't routinely do for every single patient, right? And so that's the model, I think, of communication and planning and thoughtful transfusions. Um, and I think that that is a kind of a methodology that would be excellent to, to build into a larger study of, of, you know, kind of the general patients that we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, Mike, here's a question from Mitchell Bago, which, which is an interesting one. It's like, what is the trigger? Do you happen to know, I'm sorry, what is the trigger for your perfusionist using an ultrafiltrator? Probably it's changed. Uh, since you've been paying attention to the volume and, and, and done so much work the last few years. But do you happen to know um, why a perfusionist or, or was, there, was there something in their policies and procedures 
that would cause them to say it's time for an ultrafiltrator, or do you think it was just uh, by semantics? It, it was kind of routine blanket use um, at the baseline to keep. So we had done some studies at Duke to look at hemodilution on bypass, and I think Madoff Swami Nathan's paper uh, was very good for that and looked at um, renal injury and bad outcomes if the hemoglobin dropped below seven while on bypass. And I think the knee jerk for our institution was, okay, well, we're going to hemofilter uh, everybody, and then we're going to be more aggressive to keep that above the transfusion trigger of seven, right? Um, and part of that is also the TRICS trial data that came out um, where patients that, you know, were transfused liberally or restrictively did better or worse. And so I think I think that kind of clouded the issue. But for us, it was just keep it above seven, keep them above seven. And, you know, I think practice deviated over the years, um, right up until the point that we started looking at it. I think some people thought, well, if I can keep them above seven, then if I can keep them above nine, that's even better, right? Uh, if I can push them to 10, that's even the best, right? Because our DO2 equation is going to be like fantastic. And we've plugged that in now and, you know, oh man, we're killing it. Well, you know, it's just deviation of practice. Al, do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's do one more. And, and before Bridget asks the questions, there are some phenomenal comments here. I, I wish we had time to read them all, but if, if you're still on, you know, go through the questions here because I would say about a quarter to a third of them are comments with helpful hints too, uh, supporting what Dr. Manning is saying, some, you know, perhaps uh, challenging it, but, but take a chance because we're going to have one more question, but please um, look at these. They'll be up until the, uh, the webinar is over. Um, and the last slide I'm going to have, we'll have uh, Dr. Manning's uh, email. So, um, so please feel free to reach out. He's, he said he would be happy to, to speak with anybody. So, so anyway, um, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. But Bridget, please go, go right ahead. Yes, this question is from Susan Flowers. Uh, what are your recommendations in the presence of chronic kidney disease? We have many patients presenting for cabbage pre-kidney transplant that make little or no urine at all. Those patients are, are the fringe and they're very, very difficult to manage. Um, we don't want to make those injuries worse. Mm -hmm. So we try to have those conversations ahead of time and try to limit uh, everything that we know possible. Um, we try to keep the neurotoxic drugs to a minimum. We try to keep vancomycin doses as low as possible. Um, our, our cardiac pharmacists are involved in calculating their drugs um, to their GFRs. Um, we try to keep our blood pressure and hemodynamics within 10% of their baseline, which is very tight. Uh, we try to minimize any swings. We will work with our perfusionists to have a targeted mean arterial pressure on bypass. And we ask them to not drop below that. If they have to, sure, we understand, you know, flow down for cross clamp on and off and, and some other issues that the surgeons like, but to try to really thoughtfully minimize that. And our surgeons work with us and they will bundle two or three maneuvers at the same time as much as they can so that when they ask for flow down, it's, it's, limiting it to as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then being very judicious with fluid that we give. Um, in, in patients that don't make a lot of urine or kind of marginal, um, whatever fluid they get, they can't get off very well. And certainly we don't want to have to hemofilter them in the ICU. So it's, it's, it's just a lot of thoughtful conversations. It's a lot of minute, meticulous attention to detail. Um, and there's, I don't, I don't know of a better way to say that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. And uh, I, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Manning uh, for this wonderful presentation. Obviously it's a very stimulating topic and there's a lot more 
that we could go through. I pigeonholed him by saying to keep his presentation to 30 minutes. He could have gone an hour. And obviously, as a physiologist with his background in angiotensin, you know, it's a, a whole other subject. We will definitely get him back for that. So, Dr. Manning, thank you so much. I want to also thank Bridget Palmby for her, uh, her great moderating today. So that was, uh, that was great having you. And of course, Maggie Ring, who uh, coordinates logistically everything that's going on. And of course, everybody who's attended uh, this evening's. So just to remind you, um, Dr. Manning's, Bridget's, and my emails are here. But Dr. Manning uh, said he would graciously uh, take emails. Um, and if you have any uh, topics that you would like us to address, we, we have the rest of the year filled out for our agenda topics and subject matter. But starting in uh, 2022, we're going to continue these um, uh, for at least that year. So please let us know. And we'd, uh, we'd love to, uh, to have individuals who want to present themselves um, you know, invite to, uh, to this platform. So again, thank you, everybody. Um, in about a week's time, you'll get the certificates, and this will be up on, on YouTube very shortly. So I wish everybody a great uh, great evening. And now that Duke lost uh, Coach K, um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, University of Kentucky can come back and uh, start winning games again. <laughs> Only kidding. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye.